all across the balcony, man. We, we just want to thank you for coming out on a Sunday night. We know that you probably had to park all over the city and just about a little bit of everywhere, but we're glad you made it here tonight in God's house. We're thankful for each and every one of you. Come on, friend, when God does a work, He does it exceedingly, abundantly, more than you could ever ask, think, or imagine. He does that so no man can take credit for what He does. And what you're seeing tonight is God, by His Spirit, breathing on His people, and in doing so, reviving us again. And we've been believing God for a move of His Spirit in this region for the last number of years as we've gathered folks to pray and fast and contend for the things that God has delivered to us. And I want you to know that today you're sitting in a house that others have built. You're sitting in a house that generations who came before you prayed into existence. Today you're standing on the shoulders of other people's faithfulness. And that reminds us why we stand tall, why after doing everything to stand, we continue to stand. Because one day, there will be a generation that comes after us that stands on the faithful obedience of people in this room. And I want you to know that every act of obedience has generational consequence. And when you come into alignment with the high call of God, which is in Christ Jesus... Not only does it position you in the way that you should go, that you never depart from it, but it signals to the next generation, walk in this way, and in doing so, live under the abundance of God's canopy. Guys, it's not just for us, it's for those who come after us. This is the prayer and the cry of Peter on the day of Pentecost, where he explains to the crowds who have gathered before, what you're seeing today is what Joel prophesied. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, on young and on old, on men servant and on maid servant. They will dream new dreams. They will prophesy the word in the heart of the Father. And as Peter preaches, he says, these men are not drunk as you suppose, but they've been filled with the Spirit of God. And can I tell you, friend, when God's Spirit fills your life, it's not for a one-time event. No, it's for the wind of God to blow on the sails of your life, to guide you in a direction, to explode your destiny, to propel your life, and in doing so, to shape and to form your sphere of influence. This is the God that we serve. He is so much more radically in control than we could ever imagine. He is so much more sovereign than we've dared to ever discover. This God in eternity past knew you by name and numbered the hairs on your head and nothing is a surprise to him. Nothing is too hard for this God that we serve. It's always been on God's heart for an awakening in the Northwest. Revival is always the heart of God. You don't have to ask him if he's in the mood. You don't have to wonder if he's having a good day. You don't have to maybe pray and just hope that if God would look upon you and you've earned it enough and your resume is enough and you're qualified enough and you've memorized enough verses enough. No, revival belongs to the broken. It belongs to the contrite. It belongs to the lowly in spirit. It belongs to the humble. Revival belongs to dark cities in destitute situations. Revival belongs to the lost, to the prodigal, and to the dead. Revival belongs to people who are just honest enough to admit that without God they are nothing, but with Him nothing is impossible for those who believe. And Moses, in his final sermon to the Hebrew children, in the wilderness says this, when the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you a land with large and flourishing cities that you did not build. Houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide. Wells you did not dig and vineyards and all of 
groves that you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful to not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Hear me, friend. God is still in the business of filling houses. He fills them with fresh wind and he fills them with fresh fire. But here's his one request. Don't forget where I brought you from. For while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. When you were in the miry clay, he lifted you up and placed you on the firm foundation. In the middle of your turmoil and your tyranny and your tribulation, God so loved that he gave and he sent Jesus, his one and only son. Don't forget what God took you out of. Because if it begun in the spirit, it must continue in the spirit. And sometimes things begin and we begin to believe that maybe it's about us. And maybe God's really impressed with us, and maybe we're the guest of honor, not Him. But the church exists to glorify Jesus, and in doing so, bring people into an encounter with His presence. And I think we were criticized a little bit while we were planning this event. People said, well, what's going to change? You're just going to gather a couple dozen, a couple hundred in Seattle, and you're just going to worship and pray and preach and prophesy. What's going to shift? Here's what I know. Those who have eyes to see and ears to hear in this moment are tuning in with what God desires to do. And I know not everything is accomplished in a night, but I believe that there are tipping points in God's timeline by which men and women just like me and just like you gather and call upon the name of the Lord. And in doing so, admit that in our own power we failed. And with our own programs we failed. And with our own strategies we failed. But if God would breathe on us again. Surely these dry bones can live. I love the question God asked the prophet, can these dry bones live? He responds, only you know. And God knows Seattle can live again. God knows the Northwest can live again. Friend, there's a legacy of revival, and I'm here to tell you there's still oil in the ground. There's still a river of living water, and it flows from those who believe. And wherever it goes, the trees planted next to it come to life, and they bear fruit in season and out of season. Which means this, it's always the right season for a move of God's Spirit. Fred, we're not waiting on God. He's waiting on us. The time is now. The question is clear. God is still in the business of filling houses. And God will restore to you the years that the canker worm has eaten. Seattle will not die, but it will live again. The church of Jesus Christ will not die, but it will live again. Friend, both God and the devil do math. The enemy tries to divide, but we serve the God who multiplies. Watch what the scripture says. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and fill the earth and subdue it. And rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Genesis 22, indeed I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess even the gate of their enemies. Acts 12, but the word of the Lord continued to grow and be multiplied. Hebrews 6, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. 2 Corinthians 9, now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Here's the reality. If the enemy can get you divided, he can get you destroyed. Friend, we are better together. If one puts a thousand to flight and two puts ten thousand, what could a thousand Christians do in the Northwest? I bet we could set the region ablaze. And watch the method of the miracle in Matthew 14. Then Jesus commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took five loaves and two fish. And looking up to heaven, he blessed it, and he multiplied it, or broke it, and gave the loaves to his disciples. 
and the disciples gave it to the multitudes. Watch, friend. First, it's blessed. And then it's broken. See, there is a danger in trying to multiply before being blessed. Because if it doesn't work here, why try to export it? Notice this. Not only did Jesus first bless it, then multiply it, but prior to him doing it, he asked everybody to be seated. Because there is something about a unified action that I think is of monumental importance to the working of a multiplication miracle. If we would just simply agree, nothing would be impossible for the people of God. Watch what David says, Psalms 133. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down even on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robes. See, there's an anointing that comes on your life when you make a decision to live in unity. Everybody loves the idea of multiplication, but oftentimes we hate its implications. It means your life gets more complicated, not less. It means you can't do it alone. It means not all of your preferences will survive the fire that's coming. It means you will cease to be comfortable. It means that there is more people around the table. It means you got to sit next to people you don't know. But friend, is another family hearing the gospel worth it? Is another young person delivered from addiction worth it? Is another marriage saved worth it? Is another person healed and set free worth it? Watch how the Bible warns against disunity. Romans 16, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause division and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine you have been taught. Avoid them. Titus 3 and 10, as for a person who stirs up division after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with them. Proverbs 6, there are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, heads that shed, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. Ephesians 4 and 3, strive to maintain the unity of the Spirit, watch, in the bond of peace. The reason we got to fight for unity, friend, is because it's not natural in a world blown apart by division. But it's a value worth fighting for because where there is unity, God commands a blessing. The movement of God's Spirit, hear me very carefully. The movement of God's Spirit does not come without controversy. But I'd rather be with God in the furnace than without God anywhere else. I got an article I want to show you tonight. I found it in the archives. Because this church has been around longer than anybody in this room. Planted in 1907. It was the first church in the Seattle region to experience the Pentecostal outpouring. And in doing so, God began to shake people to their core. To such a degree that they used to call us back in the day, kind of as a negative term, holy rollers. <laughs> Because all of a sudden people would get so free and people all of a sudden would come into such liberty that they didn't even know what to do but just roll around. So we got the name Holy Rollers. But can I tell you what I learned? Can I tell you what I learned? Don't judge another person's worship until you know their story. You don't know what God saved them out of. You don't know what God's redeemed them out of. You don't know the curse he's broken off their life. You don't know that they wanted to kill themselves, but now they want to live. You don't know they come out of darkness into the light. See, when people really get free, they learn how to worship. Isn't it Judas who thought that he would attack the worship of a woman who broke a pound of costly perfume at the feet of Jesus? And Jesus said to Judas, he said, don't mock this woman. Her worship will be a memorial for all generations. Oh, worship is radical because it moves our heart. No, worship stirs us to the core because it's a part of who we are. No, we were created with the need to worship something. 
And when you come alive to your creator, and all of a sudden you come into freedom, all of a sudden you begin to recognize, I don't care about the opinions of people around me. In fact, I'll be even more undignified than this. It's not unto you, it's unto him. And whether I shake, rattle, roll, jump up and down, turn around, twirl, I'm going to worship the one who has created me in his image. So I had an idea a few months ago. I thought, man, I'm going to try to look up in the archives all the different times the newspaper has written about this church. And I found hundreds of articles, many from the turn of the 1900s, real early on. But I found, I think, my favorite one. My favorite one reads like this. Holy Rollers who meet four or five times a week in the Jones Avenue Mission. That was the original name of this church, Jones Avenue Mission. Holy Rollers, who meet four or five times a week in the Jones Avenue Mission, between Sloop and Briggs Streets in Ballard, were charged by neighbors with making so much noise that sleep was impossible. Even as late as midnight and 2 o'clock in the morning, the religious enthusiasts were warned by the police. Go ahead and stand up and give God a great shout of praise in Seattle. All righty, sit back down, sit back down. <clears throat> Watch, friend. Now, people love the theory of revival more than they love the practice of revival. People love to talk about revival. They love to sermonize about revival. But when revival moves into a city, takes hold of a church, it's disruptive by its very nature. Because when Lazarus came out of the grave, it wasn't pretty. And you don't get revival without first recognizing the deathness of your own condition. You were dead in your trespasses before Christ. You weren't just bad, you were dead. But when Jesus showed up, you came alive. And when Jesus stands in front of the tomb and shouts out, Lazarus, come forth. Mary and Martha are saying, but Lord, by this time, he stinks. By this time, his body's probably already decomposing. By this time, it's not a sight that you want to see. But what I know is that when Jesus says, come forth, all of nature responds and resonates to that voice. And he came out of the tomb, and he stank. And the first thing that Jesus says is, unwind those grave clothes off of that man. And it was disruptive by its very nature. You can have control or you can have revival, but friend, you can't have both. And what I've found is the Spirit of God has come to comfort people who are disrupted and disrupt people who are comfortable. And when God's Spirit begins to breathe, I think so often... Like David's mighty men, we try to reach out and steady the ark. No, God, this much, but no more. No, God, I really like to visit it, but don't move in. No, God, it was really fun, and I got goosebumps, but I don't think it could ever happen again because really what I like is where I was, not where I'm going. But God says, friend, will you give me permission to to take you by the hand and to lead you into the next season of my faithfulness for your life. and It will feel different and it will look different and there's going to be some growing pains and there's going to be some change and there's going to be some renewal and there's going to be some grave clothes that you've got to take off and there's probably going to be a little stink that comes from your life, but it's worth it to get strength back in your life and life back in your bones. It's worth it to go all in on the message of revival. What if they call the cops on us? They will. What if they complain about the parking? They will. 
But what happens when we make a few enemies? It will happen. But we've made a decision to count the cost of what it looks like to follow Jesus. And here's what I've found, friend. A burning church will set the world ablaze. I think there's this misconception that if we just do church right, or if we just do ministry right, we will be liked by the entire neighborhood and celebrated by everybody who walks by. Friends, they killed Jesus. And Jesus says, if they hated me, they're probably going to hate you too. It's not like we go out of our way to be hated. Because it's still the kindness of God that leads men under repentance. You don't go out of your way to be abrasive. You love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. For in those two commandments, all the law and the prophets hang. But can I tell you, when you come into renewal, it'll make you as many friends as it does enemies. But you got to count the cost. Is it worth it to follow Jesus? Not everything nor everyone can come where you're going. But friend, count the cost. And in doing so. See, God, do a fresh work in your life. Where are the people who turn cities upside down? Where are the people who disrupt spiritual principalities and powers? Where are the people who remain undeterred by whatever the world throws at them? When Paul ministers in Ephesus, the city riots. When Paul and Silas preach Christ in Thessalonica, a mob gathers in the marketplace to beat up new converts. When Paul and Silas enter Philippi, they are assaulted and thrown in jail. When Peter and John preach the gospel in Jerusalem, the Sanhedrin arrests them and hold them for trial. In fact, in the New Testament, the most common response to the preaching of the gospel was riots, disruption, and prison. And we want accolades, converts, and compliments. You cannot pray for revival and then be unwilling to deal with its consequences. When God shows up, friend, everything changes. Cities shift, regions are changed, and nothing irritates the enemy more than that. Let me show you something quickly this evening out of Luke 4. Starting in verse 14, the Bible tells us the story of Jesus. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about Him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised Him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of God's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue was fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And Jesus is quoting the prophet Isaiah. In the first recorded sermon he will ever preach. And Jesus says seven things. The Spirit of God is on me. He has anointed me. I'm going to proclaim good news. I'm going to proclaim freedom. I'm going to proclaim healing. I'm going to proclaim deliverance. And I'm going to proclaim favor. Friend, the kingdom of God isn't an argument for something. It's the proclamation of something. Good news, freedom, healing, deliverance, favor. That sounds like revival to me. That should be our norm, and it could be if we would simply learn to honor the presence of Jesus. And then Jesus says, today the scripture is fulfilled. Jesus is saying, I am the fulfillment of what your prophets foretold, the one that you've been waiting for. They knew the scriptures, hear me, they studied the history, they worshiped in the synagogue, but ultimately the people who were waiting for the Messiah would miss out on the Messiah because it didn't look like they thought it would look. And Jesus weeps over Jerusalem in Luke 19 because people missed the day of their visitation. The Jewish people wanted deliverance from the Romans, but Jesus came to deliver them from their sin. The people wanted a political answer. God responded with a spiritual one. Hear me. Don't miss out on what God wants to do in this region because it looks different than you thought it would. Don't miss out on what God wants to do in this region because you are so focused on the Romans around you that you overlook the sin inside of you. 
In verse 22 it says this, All spoke well of him, and they were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. They said this, Isn't this Joseph's son? I want you to take note here because here's where the narrative shifts. They were amazed at his words, but they said to one another, Isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this just another service? Isn't this just another prayer meeting? Isn't this just another altar call, another conference? Isn't this just another church gathering? Here's the problem, friend. You can't receive from what you won't honor. Sometimes we become so casual with the anointing, we cease to recognize that the Holy Spirit is a person. He can be grieved, he can be mocked, he can be ignored, or he can be welcomed. The choice is yours. He's not just invited, he's welcomed, he's wanted, he's desired. Because if you get the presence, you get everything else. Isn't this Joseph's son? Isn't this Seattle? I feel like what God's going to do next in this region is going to cause people to say about this city what they said about Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Are you sure you said Seattle? Are you sure it's not the Bible Belt? Are you sure it's not the Midwest? I know God lives in Texas and he's doing some things there, but <laughs> did you really say Seattle? I, did, did I hear that right? Are you sure you said that? Because that don't make sense on my radar. That don't make sense in my mind. Are you sure we're talking about the same thing? And I'm here to tell you if God can do it in the little town of Snohomish, he can do it in the big town of Seattle. Because God is no respecter of person, and I don't think he's a respecter of places. In fact, I think God is closest to some of the darkest places we have. And all I know is that when a city seems like it's on a fast track towards death, that's when God, by his spirit, intervenes. I'm here to challenge you to think about this as our moment to rewrite the narrative of what people will say about this city. That in a hundred years, another group of folks would gather at a church that's probably not even built by now, and they would show videos of people just like me and just like you who gathered in this city to believe for another move of God. It's not just the history of what God has done. It's the present day implication of what God by His Spirit is going to continue to do. Friends, we go after revival, not just for us, but because we want to hand it to our children and our children's children, that they would grow up in a move of God's Spirit. We have the opportunity to give them a story of their own. Give them a story of their, watch what happens. The Bible says this, now in verse 28, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. In verse 22, the people are amazed at Jesus. In the process of six short verses, the people go from being amazed to being furious. Now watch what happens. And the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. So they got up, drove him out of the town, took him to the top of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went his way. Friend, I think that there is a subtle misnomer about ministry today. Like if we just play it safe... Everyone will be amazed and give us compliments on how well we've done and we'll take no flack and everyone will be happy we're here. But if we judge the success of our movement off the opinions of the crowd, we will constantly live under the tyranny of man and the approval of culture. It didn't matter how furious the crowd was. It didn't matter that they were trying to violently throw him off a cliff. It was still the year of God's favor. And when God puts his anointing on your life, it overcomes every objection and it demolishes every argument. Friend, we don't run from storms, we run through them. 
We don't run from controversy. We stand in the midst of it. We don't run from hardship. We endure through it. Revival is the most costly thing that you will ever do, but it's worth it to pursue the presence of God with everything that you have. Now, costless Christianity has produced powerless Christianity. Friend, it will cost you everything to follow him. It'll cost you the opinions of the crowd. It'll cost you the opinions of the social media platforms that so much of your identity is wrapped up in. It will cost you the opinion of your peers, the comfort of your position, the stability of your organizational system, friend, revival, costs you everything. But it's worth it to follow Jesus. It's worth it to host an encounter with its spirit. It's worth it to see young and old alike begin to dream again. And that's what I'm challenging you with this evening. This is the pearl of great price. Selling everything we have to follow Jesus. And in doing so, committing to do it His way. I feel like there's a prophetic declaration over this church and over this city. From the book of Isaiah. Where the prophet Isaiah, speaking to a fractured nation, says this, They will rebuild the ancient ruins. They will restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. And instead of your shame, you will receive a double portion. And instead of disgrace, you will rejoice in your inheritance. And so you will inherit a double portion in your land, and everlasting joy will be yours. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. He will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and raise up the age old foundations you will be called repairer of broken walls and restorer of streets with dwellings friend that is what God intends to do in this city and while the rest of the world seems to be running from this region friend we're gonna stay and fight because God has given us the land Everywhere the sole of your foot treads, what you set your hand forth to do, in fact, will prosper. Why? Because from the announcement of Jesus forward, the Spirit of God has also been on you and anointed you to preach good news and anointed you to proclaim the year of God's favor and anointed you to bring freedom to those who are in captivity. Friend, this is our moment to see God do something significant again in this region. Come on, would you close your eyes all across this room? Come on, just for a moment, friend, I want you to visualize. I want you to dream with God what He could do in this region. I want you to see streets filled with people worshiping Jesus. I want you to see another Jesus people movement where God raises up millennials and Gen Zers who are disenfranchised with the faith, who are running far from God, who are strung out and addicted in every substance, but turning to God by the thousands. Could you see it? Could you see it tonight? Could God plant a seed in your heart by which you would begin to dream and pray and cry out again for a visitation, in fact, an inhabitation of God's Spirit in our region? Could you see it, friend, today? Could you see not just one church, but many churches coming under revival, beginning to grow and flourish, reaching neighborhoods and cities and regions with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Friend, could you see it? God, tonight we're making a decision to trust you with what lays ahead. You have never met a region too difficult that you can't reach. So God, tonight we're adding our faith together. And we're declaring over every mountain, be uprooted and cast into the sea. We're declaring over every mulberry tree, be uprooted and cast into the sea. And God, by your spirit, breathe on the northwest again. God, by your spirit, breathe on the northwest again. And Father, we'll give you all the praise. We'll give you all the glory. We'll give you all the honor, both now and forever. In Jesus' name, come on, all God's people said, amen, amen.
Friend, over the next number of months, we're going to be gathering here one Sunday a month in the evening. We're going to rally the region for prayer, intercession, and worship. And as we do, there are things that begin to shift in an unseen atmosphere. It's like when Paul and Silas were in the prison in the city of Philippi, and the Bible says, but at midnight, they begin to pray and to sing hymns. And as they did, God shook the city, and prison doors flew open. And all of a sudden, God, by His power, manifested His strength in a region. And from that miracle experience, a church in the city of Philippi with Lydia and the Philippian jailer started, and a gospel witness went forth. And I just believe in the power of God's people gathering in unity to lift high the name of Jesus. So we're going to do this over the next number of months. We're going to get as many people as we can in the building, and we're going to pray, we're going to praise, we're going to worship, and we're going to prophesy. And I believe that as we do, we're going to see things shift for the better. And I want you to know that many of the things that you pray for, you will not recognize the weight of until you reach eternity's shore. And you hear those words from your master, well done, good and faithful servant. And you look at a sea of people, many of you don't recognize, who say, I'm here because of your prayers. You don't know it, but somebody somewhere was praying, and God got a hold of my heart. Somebody somewhere was praying, and God began to turn the soil of the northwest. Somebody somewhere was praying and all of a sudden I had an angelic encounter in the night. Somebody somewhere was praying and I was just in my house trying to sleep in Ballard but I heard a sound and God began to work on my heart. You won't ever know the impact your prayers make. No, you're here today because somebody prayed you into the kingdom. You're here today because you had a mom or a dad who wouldn't give up on you. You're here today because a youth pastor loved you when nobody else would. You're here today because a youth leader took you under the arm and taught you the way that you could go. You're here today because of somebody else's prayer. So all I'm asking you to do is to remember that. That's the reason we gather. Because the lamb is worthy to receive the reward of his suffering. And so we're declaring over this region, give up your dead and give up your backslidden and your prodigal and your addicted. And it's the prayers of the saints that do work in the ground of the Northwest. Now, when I reach eternity, when you reach eternity, you go see a harvest of souls who are here because simple obedience changes history. Tonight isn't just about the region, it's about you. I know that there's a lot of folks and it's crowded and it's hot and we're just trying to figure out where to sit and where to stand, but I wouldn't want you to leave tonight without an opportunity to see breakthrough in your life. Over the last number of months, we've seen God do incredible work in the heart and the lives of people. And if you're here tonight and you need breakthrough in your life, you need a miracle in your life, friends, you're in the right place. Not because there's anything special about us, but because there's everything special about Him. And when we create an atmosphere that honors the presence of God, God shows up and He shows off. And He is the Father of lights and He delights in His children. And every good and perfect gift comes from the Father above. And I believe tonight He wants to show Himself strong in your life. Come on, we've been praying for this event. We've been believing for this event. This thing has been birthed in prayer. And I believe that tonight is a night of encounter and breakthrough for many of you in this room. And I believe that there's others of you in this room. And I'm not sure what age you are, but you might be a little older. And you feel like maybe the dream of God or the flame of God has died down just a little bit in my life. And I want to lay my hands on you and add my faith to yours. Because God, by His Spirit, is stirring you up again to dream new dreams. Friend, your best days are not behind you. They're ahead of you. And together we're going to see a move of God that unites the generations, brings together different ethnicities, brings people from different places in our socioeconomic system. And together we're going to revolve around the centrality of God's one and only Son, lifting up His name, the name which is above every other name. Come on, why don't you stand one more time all across this room. We're going to end in some worship and some prayer. We want to make room for you tonight to receive. And 
I know it's packed and I know it's late and for many of you it's been a long night and I want to say thank you for coming, thank you for joining us. Come on friend, tonight is significant. What we're doing tonight matters. You matter. Your contribution matters. Your attendance matters. And together we're going to see the goodness of God in the land of the living. In just a moment, I'm going to invite those of you forward who need prayer. We're going to somehow make room here at the altar. But I want to pray for you. I want to add my faith to yours to see God do a miracle in your life. In just a moment, we're going to invite you forward. Some of you might already be up here. And the altar call already pertains to you. So just feel free to stay right where you're at. But others of you, you need to respond. You need to come forward. You need a young man or a young woman or a young pastor to lay hands on you and to believe for God's best in your life. Come on, friend, we're in this thing together, but God has saved his best for last. And let's see God do his work at these altars before we leave this place this evening. Friend, if you're in here tonight and you need a physical miracle, he said, Pastor, in my body, I need a miracle. I've got a diagnosis. I've got a disease that I'm dealing with. I got an ailment. It might be an injury from work. It might be something that has run in your family. It might be chronic. It might be something that, uh, that has been passed down from different generations. Whatever it would be, we serve the great physician. And tonight is a night of healing in your physical body. Friends, you might be here tonight and you might be under a spirit of oppression. You've got heaviness in your life. You're dealing with depression, anxiety, stress. It might be something that's a officially diagnosed or maybe not, friend, tonight is a night of breakthrough for your life. I want to add my faith to yours to see God do a miracle. Come on, there is a heaviness in this region that the enemy has tried to put on the northwest, and we are officially breaking agreement with what the enemy has meant to steal, kill, and destroy. Tonight's a night of freedom. You might be here tonight, you say, Pastor, I need my heart to come alive in a fresh way. I need that fire of God to stir in me once again. God, revive your work in my life. God, revive your presence in my life. God, revive your spirits working in and through me. I'm not just going to be a spectator. I'm not just going to sit by and watch other people do the stuff. God, here am I. Send me. Some of you, that's you in this place, and you need to make that declaration. In just a moment, I'm going to invite you forward. And we're going to turn this place into a house of prayer and a house of worship. And I'm telling you, we're going to see the power of God on full display. Guess what? It's going to be messy. Hear me. Guess what? It's going to be chaotic. Hear me. Guess what? It's going to be emotional. Hear me. Guess what? It's going to be a little complicated. But revival always is, and it's worth it to pay the price. Come on, would you just raise your hands all across this room. Father, now in the mighty name of Jesus, we say, Spirit, breathe on us again. Breathe on us again. Breathe on us again. God, we're going to give you all the praise. We're going to give you all the glory. We just say, Father, breathe on us again. By your Spirit, by your Spirit, breathe on us again. Father, we say, breathe on the young and the old. That young men would dream dreams. That young men and young women would prophesy. That old men and old women would dream new dreams. That God, by your spirit, you would do something in this region. That you would do something on these young people. That you would anoint them, Father, with fresh fire. God, that you would do more in them than you've done in me. God, that you would pour out on them everything that you've saved up from generations past. We say, God, do it again. We say, God, do it again. We say, God, do it again. By your spirit, now in Jesus' name.